Uh, you're We're supposed to talk five to seven minutes. Five to seven? Yes. Okay. I thought you said ten. So. Okay. Well, in practice, it often has been ten. But. Are you the chair? Or oh, no, no, no. Who's no. The chair? Are you a discussant then? Well, well, that's the chair. Yeah, I'm a discussant as well. My presentation. Mm-hmm. So from five to seven. Well, Okay, I think it's uh, time for us to start, um, and I'm told that only if we start will people outside uh, take our warnings seriously. Um, my name is Michael Byers. I'm an associate professor here at Duke Law School. I have the distinct advantage of uh, not being an intellectual property lawyer. In fact, I'm not even a trade lawyer, uh, and this means that I can be incredibly tough with speakers and not have to worry about any retaliation within my own field. Um, <laughs> I'm also the, the father of, of two little boys, and so my patience with people who procrastinate is particularly short. Um, <laughs> and I tell you this because I intend to act entirely in your interest as the audience uh, this afternoon. It's an incredibly beautiful day in Durham, North Carolina. There's a reception starting at 7.30 p.m. It's my goal to give you the maximum amount of time between this session and that reception so that you can enjoy the beautiful weather and the blossoms on the trees. So why don't we adjourn right now? <laughs> <laughs> I thought very seriously about that. Um, but I don't think Jerry would let me. <laughs> so without any further ado, I'm going to move to the first speaker, uh, Professor Jus Powellen of Duke Law School, uh, speaking on the nature of WTO dispute settlement. Jus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. And, and uh, thank you, Jerry, for having yet another Duke law colleague on, on this conference. It has been very interesting also for a, a trade lawyer because that is my, my background. Um, my little presentation is based on a paper I, I wrote last year. Um, and I'm only presenting it now because last year I was still working for the WTO. So uh, since it is not very popular among trade lawyers, what I'm going to say, I thought that it would be a good idea to present it to people who have concerns about uh, public goods. Um, essentially, my paper, which is included in the materials, is, is a, about a, a rather intricate legal problem related to the nature of WTO obligations. Um, I've made it a little bit broader so that it fits better into the context of this conference. But I will essentially discuss um, the tension that I see when it comes to WTO dispute settlement between uh, sovereign or government interests private rights and the public good. Um, so basically the role of those three different uh, concepts within that WTO dispute settlement uh, mechanism. Uh, again, my bias is that uh, I was advising WTO panels and uh, there's actually one very prominent WTO panelist uh, in this audience here, Thomas Cotier. And at uh, the end of my tenure at the WTO, I was also shortly advising the WTO appellate body. So, so that's why um, I, did, I did some thinking about this. Um, what is the problem that I see when I say that there's this tension uh, for the moment? Um, and of course, the problem relates to the process, WTO dispute settlement. I will not talk about the substantive WTO rules. Okay. So my, my basic two questions are, is the DSU, the Dispute Settlement Understanding, does it sufficiently recognize public goods? And I wasn't here during the first day of this, this conference where you, you, you defined the, the, the concept of public goods, but the way I see it, uh, there's basically two strands of public goods uh, relevant during WTO Dispute Settlement. First of all, uh, conforming with trade rules, with IP rules, may very well serve the public good. Uh, in terms of IP innovation, I guess, in terms of trade, uh, a more efficient allocation of uh, resources. Uh, besides that, I guess, you also have uh, public goods at stake if you allow members not to follow WTO obligations. So non-trade related public goods, um, in case you qualify for an exemption on the IP obligations or trade obligations, 
allowing you to, say, restrict trade for health, uh, environmental, or other non-trade purposes. So a second strand of uh, public goods that the WTO may be worried about. Of course, when I say public goods, uh, I think in contrast to that, one may also ask the question whether private rights are sufficiently protected at the WTO. So therefore, the, the tension that I uh, see. Now, the, the, the first thing that I want to address in this uh, relationship is basically how the WTO system operates. And, and I will, in, in the next slide, uh, talk a bit about the, the, the nature of WTO obligations. Now, I think when you look at how the WTO treaties are negotiated, I think that the WTO is essentially about private export interests, which are defended, taken up by governments. So surely this is intergovernmental, but what we are talking about is no longer state enterprises or anything like that, but is uh, private economic operators. We have trade obligations for their benefit. Okay? So trade liberalization and IP uh, protection is in the interest mostly of uh, private economic operators. Not just firms, companies, producers, but also consumers, obviously. Now, although this is about private interests, as you all know, only governments negotiate at the WTO, only governments enforce WTO obligations. So the, the governments will enforce those private uh, interests. And again, especially on the export side. A, a WTO complainant will only uh, have an, an, an export interest in mind. He will want to open uh, markets, he will want to export goods to, uh, to a particular country. So the, the governments take up the private interests, and fortunately or unfortunately, WTO is all about trade, so it's all about creating market access, and the complainant will always have the law on its side, so to speak. Uh, public goods, especially the non-trade related public goods, essentially come in only on the defendant's side. Okay, so you have a complainant complaining about a trade restriction or about uh, lack of IP protection, it will be for the defendant to rely on public goods such as environmental protection, uh, transfer of te technology. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the, those public goods are put on the defensive, and they are the alleged protectionists because they restrict trade, and they will have to justify why they are uh, doing so. So, so this is basically how the, the, the system operates in, in that... Uh, uh, relationship between sovereign interest, private rights, and, and public goods. Now, to the, to the core, especially of my paper, and I think that is perhaps the, the more controversial side of it, um, I see the WTO, those IP trade obligations, as essentially a bundle or a balance of bilateral relationships. Uh, bear with me. It, I think it's a it's a very important uh, distinction distinction that that I tried to introduce here, and that is essentially the question of whether violation of WTO obligations is a purely bilateral matter, or whether it is something that, per definition, affects all WTO members. So, if you compare it to a, a domestic law analogy. The question is, is WTO a contract between two states, which is multilateralized 145 times, or is WTO comparable more to uh, penal law, criminal law, whereby if you violate WTO obligations, you necessarily affect everyone. So the question is basically, is the WTO in the collective interest of all WTO members, or can it be reduced, can a trade dispute be reduced to a bilateral relationship? Uh, of course, my point of view that it is more of a contract type treaty, albeit a multilateral treaty, that's not the question. It's equally binding, and it's not reciprocal in the sense that you only comply if others comply. If my view is uh, 
if, if my view is correct, this will have uh, enormous consequences, not just for the remedies that you would offer, but also for how uh, the WTO treaty interacts with other treaties. And I think you mentioned that quite a bit in, in, in your discussion. So it's basically asking the question, is the WTO about reciprocal bilateral obligations, or is it about collective obligations? Um, I think especially in support of the contract view of the WTO, the way dispute settlement operates is purely bilateral. So that clearly supports the contract view of it, in the sense that you do not have a public prosecutor in the public interest uh, starting initiating a WTO complaint. Everything happens state to state, government to government, both the procedure and very importantly also the end result if compliance does not follow the trade sanctions, the retaliations, or purely state to state. There's no collective um, uh, interest uh, operating here. So based on, on that basic summary of my view of the, the, the nature of WTO obligations, I think um, it's fair to say that the WTO dispute settlement is focusing heavily on government interests, bilateral government interests, uh, and not so much on some collective conscience or collective interest, the way, for example, um, human rights treaties would operate, or a, a large number of environmental treaties would operate, where if you violate a human rights treaty, you necessarily breach the, the, the rights of all members to the treaty. Whereas if you violate the WTO treaty, in my mind, you may violate the rights of a lot of WTO members, if there's trade or if there's potential trade at issue, but not necessarily all of them. So it's basically distinguishing between types of uh, obligations under international law, the collective ones and the bilateral ones. Now, in, in that setting, so if I'm correct, what about public goods then? Because of course, if you believe in the bilateral nature of the WTO, uh, at least the public good of having free trade or of having IP protection may not be sufficiently protected. So on the positive side of this, I think generally speaking, public goods are somehow protected in the WTO dispute settlement. Again, I'm talking about process, not about uh, substantive rules. And that you, of course, only have governments who will initiate complaints. So governments will, op will uh, operate under a filtering system. They will not uh, bring all complaints. They will look at the public interest, political side effects of bringing a complaint. Private parties cannot bring complaints. So that may be uh, a filter process that, that works in the interest of, of certain public goods. Uh, secondly, although the mechanism, the dispute settlement mechanism is purely state to state, you have third parties that can intervene. You have other countries that can submit briefs. And uh, recently as well, uh, you have even private entities, NGOs, uh, so-called uh, amicus curiae, that can submit briefs and intervene perhaps in the public interest. Although most of the, the briefs that have been submitted were basically by uh, the steel industry or some, some private business interest, which is also an NGO uh, in, the, in the wide term of the, the word. Now, the, the negative side of the current system, when you think about does the system really operate in the interest of, of the public good, the negative side of it, of course, is that uh, the whole procedure, the mechanism of, of dispute settlement, uh, is confidential and lacks uh, openness. Everything is behind closed doors. Um, you cannot read the submissions and you only know basically uh, what's really happening when, when the judgment, when the report comes out. Now, another negative um, aspect of the current system when you think of public goods is I think that you have a lot of bilateral disputes ongoing and you have a lot of reports, judgments coming out because the system is basically compulsory. There's no longer a need to, to have a consensus decision to, to adopt the reports. But in contrast to that very swift and automatic dispute settlement system, you have a legislative branch that is completely deadlocked. Uh, as you have seen in the, uh, on the issue of essential medicines, if one country vetoes, uh, you go nowhere. So, so that creates problems in terms of the legislature correcting 
judgments that may perhaps not be in the collective interest of, of all WTO members. I, I've seen in your papers that a lot of you criticize certain panel reports. These days, it's very difficult to correct them. It's easy to issue a panel report. You just appoint uh, three judges, and, and it's automatically adopted. But to change or to, to reinterpret something that a panel has already said is very difficult, at least from the legislative uh, point of view. Now, um, those were some general points on, on how public goods uh, operate in the system. Now, if we focus in particular on the first strand of public goods that I pointed out, the, the, the public goods that may be protected by ensuring compliance with trade obligations, by freeing up trade, by pr pr protecting IP, I think the, the current mechanism could be uh, substantially improved by no longer purely focusing on bilateral enforcement, but perhaps um, really taking some lessons from how other treaties operate, uh, such as in environmental treaties or other systems where you have more of a compliance mechanism, where the whole system is no longer purely bilateral, but, but takes into account multilateral interests. I know for, for many people, especially trade lawyers, they often laugh at how MEAs are uh, enforced, how, how environmental treaties are enforced because they lack teeth, they all say. But I think uh, we could keep the WTO teeth, but we could also add uh, some collective aspects to, to, to things that are common in, in environmental treaties, but remain purely bilateral in, in trade agreements. So you could think of collective remedies, for example, um, and you could even think of uh, the WTO secretariat or the WTO as an institution taking uh, a more proactive role, especially in dispute settlement. Um, in the long run, perhaps the way the, the European Commission uh, puts forward a, 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 a view in the collective or the common interest of, of, of free trade, the WTO secretariat making, for example, the papers that it writes in dispute settlement uh, uh, somewhat public. All of that is today completely uh, confidential and, and is never sees the light of day. Um, the, the, second, the second strand of public goods that I identified, those non-trade related public goods, environment, um, transfer of technology. So public goods that you may achieve by providing for exceptions, by not enforcing uh, trade liberalization, basically. How could you... Um, improve their protection in WTO dispute settlement. Um, I see basically three uh, ways of doing that, or three main ways of doing this. I'm sure you've already spoken about the first way of doing it, and that is uh, interpreting the WTO treaty, not only based on the text of the treaty, but looking at those provisions in context and in the light of object and purpose. As you all know, for the moment, the appellate body has taken a very textual approach to treaty interpretation. Um, they always at least pay lip service to object and purpose, um, but it, it could be strengthened in, in certain ways. And if you look, for example, at the Doha Declaration, as you all know, uh, they make it very explicit in that declaration, which is not a dispute settlement declaration or a judgment, but something that was adopted by all WTO members. They make it very clear that the TRIPS agreement should allow for the provision of essential drugs, basically because of the object and purpose uh, stated in the, the TRIPS uh, agreement, Article six, uh, Article 7 and 8, I think. So if you look at the object and purpose of um, not just liberalizing trade, but also of protecting the environment, something that is in the preamble of the WTO, of, of transferring technology, of of uh, caring also for health and non-trade issues, it may be possible to take better care of those uh, non-trade public goods. Now, the, the second way, and it, it's still under the heading of treaty interpretation, uh, is to look at, so in the interpretation of WTO rules, is to look at other treaties, especially treaties that deal with those public goods, say international environmental agreements, or some of the agreements you've been discussing in the previous session, and to use those agreements to give meaning to the WTO treaty. Now, at least from the international lawyer's point of view, uh, one can only do so if those agreements reflect the common intentions of all WTO members. Uh, and actually, we, we already have certain cases where this was done, where the, the WTO, which traditionally has done everything within the four corners 
of the WTO agreement, where the WTO went out of those four corners and really looked at non-trade agreements to, to give meaning to the, to the GATT. They looked at, in the shrimp turtle decision, for example, they looked at a number of uh, environmental agreements to conclude that exhaustible natural resources, and not just minerals, but also living resources. So you can protect uh, endangered, endangered turtle, for example. Now, the, the last way of perhaps improving the protection of public goods, and here we go a step further yet, uh, something that has not been uh, explicitly done so far, but I think there's no way out in the long run, is for the WTO to, um, of course, only enforce WTO obligations, but for the WTO panels also to allow defendants, that is, those who want to promote public goods, for those defendants to also allow to invoke, to rely on non-WTO treaties to justify trade restrictions. And here we are talking about Vienna Convention, about Article 30, how the different treaties interrelate. And here there's no need for all WTO members to be bound by those non-treaties. And there's, in recent months actually, there's a number of very interesting examples that point at this, uh, at this process. The, the Tobacco Convention, I can talk about it if you want. The Kimberley scheme, scheme, which imposes trade restrictions for, for conflict diamonds, of course the MEAs, multilateral environmental agreements, all of those treaties could actually be pleaded also before WTO panels, not as a complaint, not to enforce those obligations, but to rely on them uh, in defense on the defendant side. Now, um, I will skip this slide, but of course the, the question may be raised, what do we do if the defendant does not invoke the public good, does not express the public interest? Um, should the judge do it on its own initiative? That's a more procedural question. Um, finally, coming back to my trilemma, so to speak, the, the fact that there's also private rights at issue, the main problem, of course, with my approach would be that you uh, have a more flexible WTO treaty. So you look at non-WTO treaties as well, uh, which may uh, make it less predictable for private parties. That is definitely true. But as I, as I say there, that may be the cost of, of, of having obligations that are enforceable uh, in the first place and of having a, a, a democratic safety valve where you basically allow sovereigns, where you allow governments to contract out of certain WTO obligations. This is a summary of, of, of the discussion, but I, basically my main point is that I think um, we should look at WTO obligations as bilateral uh, in nature, which may make the enforcement of public trade goods um, less, uh, less of, a, of a reality, but at the same time I think it would uh, protect the non-trade public goods far more if we construe, if we put those WT obligations in, in that bilateral perspective. Thank you. Well, that was very impressive compliance. Um, <laughs> our next speaker is Eric Bond. Eric? Okay, uh, the paper I'm going to talk about today is The Economics of International Agreements and Dispute Settlement. And uh, I have to apologize because I'm going to set the low-tech bound here by not only using overheads but actually having handwritten some of them. So I hope you can read my, uh, uh, my writing here. Uh, so, so this paper is addressed at two questions. Uh, looking at related to international property rights agreements, and the first question is, uh, does the WTO model of trade agreements fit IPRs? So the WTO has been very successful at uh, reducing uh, tariffs uh, in the post-war period. An important part of that, particularly recently, has been the dispute settlement process. So, so one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, does, do the mechanisms, the principles, and institutions that work with the WTO, are they the right things to be using for intellectual property rights? Uh, the second question is, you know, should IPR agreements be bundled with trade agreements, as in the TRIPS case, or should they be self-standing agreements? 
Now, when I talk about the WTO approach to trade agreements, what I have in mind is the following ideas. Uh, first of all, reciprocal tariff reductions with the MFN principle, uh, the principle of national treatment, and then a dispute settlement process in which you have used the withdrawal of equivalent concessions to punish uh, a country that either doesn't fulfill its obligations or takes some actions to nullify an obligation uh, under the agreement. Now, there's been some work uh, recently by Bagwell and Steger who argue that the structure of the WTO is, is very effective for dealing with uh, a terms of trade driven prisoner's dilemma that we see in, interna in international tariff setting policy. And the basic idea is that when I raise my tariff, uh, I have a negative impact on the export interests in the other country, and I'm not taking that into account when I, when I set that tariff. And since the other country has a, has a similar uh, effect, uh, what we're going to get is an equilibrium in which tariffs are too high. And so as a result, there's uh, benefits here from reciprocal tariff reductions in which I lower m my tariffs in return for you lowering your tariffs, uh, which, which gives us then the attractive feature of reciprocal tariff reductions because when we both do this, we can both be better off as a result of this, uh, uh, this agreement. Now the problem with this, of course, is that I'm even better off if you lower your tariff and I don't lower mine. Uh, and, so, and so we have to deal with the problem of punishment. These, uh, these agreements have to be, in some sense, self-enforcing. It has to be in the interest of the countries to follow it because we don't have effective court mechanisms for, for imposing punishments. Uh, so the dispute settlement process is potentially one way in which that can be done. That if, if you don't fulfill your obligation, uh, then, or take some action to nullify the obligation, then uh, I can, I can uh, uh, pursue a dispute settlement uh, with you. And uh, uh, if, you, if you fail to comply, then I can punish you by withdrawing uh, equivalent concessions. Okay. So the purpose of this paper, or what I do in this paper, is set up a very simple model of intellectual property rights protection and then use it to ask these questions of, is there a prisoner's dilemma being uh, in, in the intellectual property rights system? And do the WTO mechanisms and dispute settlement uh, work in this uh, setting? And, and is what we see in the TRIPS uh, sort of consistent with this model of, uh, of uh, intellectual property rights? Okay. Now, the one I'm going to take, as I presume you're all familiar with, it's a standard, uh, very simple model in which we have a trade-off between static efficiency losses and dynamic gains from having a patent enforcement. So you can think of a, a products here where you can produce the product at a constant marginal cost of C. Uh, and once the product has been innovated, and uh, you can think of this as being uh, uh, one of a number of differentiated products that could potentially be introduced. Uh, if, if the patent, when the patent is in, in effect, uh, the, the patent owner sets the monopoly price uh, and earns profits pi, and then you get consumer surplus SM uh, from the monopoly case, and there's a deadweight loss of delta. Uh, when the patent expires, then you get a competitive surplus, which is the sum of the SM pi and the deadweight loss. So the static gain from having the patent expire then uh, is the, the delta of deadweight loss. Uh, of course, the, the sooner the patent expires, the less attractive it is for innovators uh, to enter. Therefore, the fewer products you get and the fewer surplus, the less surplus you get from, those, uh, uh, from the smaller number of products. Okay? So that's, that's the basic IPR uh, trade-off here. And so what I want to do is think of countries now choosing uh, to set two parameters, what I'm going to call theta. Uh, which is the protection of home innovations, and mu, which is the protection of uh, foreign innovations. And so we're going to now allow initially you to discriminate against foreign innovators. Uh, you, we won't impose uh, national treatment uh, initially. Uh, you can sort of think of, you might think of theta here as either the duration of the patent protection uh, relative to the uh, uh, life of the product or uh, the probability that, that you, you're able to sustain this uh, protection against uh, uh, potential infringers. Okay? And so for theta of the time, you're going to be getting uh, the monopoly payoff. And for 1 minus theta of the time, then you will be getting the, uh, 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 the competitive payoff. 
on home innovations. Okay. Now, the, the, uh, the important point to see here is this asymmetry then between uh, uh, foreign innovations, uh, for the innovations uh, produced by foreign innovators and those in produced by domestic innovators. Because from the, the country's point of view, the cost of a, of a home innovation in deadweight loss is delta. Uh, the cost of a foreign innovation is delta plus pi because the profits are going to foreigners. Okay. So, so one of the things that's going to happen then is that, that there's a presumption that when you uh, set your terms of, when you set your parameters, you see you're going to set your theta higher than your mu, meaning you're going to you're going to want to grant greater protection to your domestic firms that are innovating than to the foreign firms. So you're not going to want to give national treatment initially uh, because of this larger cost. And it's this feature that's creating the prisoner's dilemma. Okay, because there are two kinds of spillovers that are going on here. Now, when I lengthen my patent protection. Uh, I'm not taking into account the impact that it's having on profits of your firms that innovate in my market. So that's, that's very much like the terms of trade spillover that we see in the tariff case. Okay? But the second form of spillover, which is I think unique to the IPR case, is that you also get an externality uh, by the change in the level of innovations across countries. So in addition to the, the profit effect, there's also a change in the number of innovations when I lengthen my, uh, my patent life we get more innovations, and uh, the foreign country enjoys some of those innovations as well. Okay. Now we can sort of summarize that in the following picture. So this is the uh, mu here is the home country's uh, parameter for uh, uh, patent protection on foreign goods. Mu star is the home is the foreign country's protection of home countries. So it's it's the protection you're giving to uh, non-residents. And V here is the payoff to the uh, to the home country. And so you benefit when foreigners extend patent protection. So you're better off as you move in this direction, and the foreign country is better off in this direction because uh, greater home country patent protection of foreigners. Uh, raises the, uh, the payoff to the home country. And so the prisoner's dilemma is the fact that if we look at this point, which is the optimum, the, the Nash equilibrium when countries set these property rights protections unilaterally, uh, you can make both countries better off by moving in this direction. Okay? So extending both uh, foreign patent protection and home patent protection of uh, innovations produced in the other country uh, can be welfare improving for both. Okay? And it's that sort of re reciprocal relationship uh, which, is, which is sort of similar to what we see in the tariff case. Okay? Now, now this is sort of moving in the direction of national treatment, but there's actually no guarantee here that national treatment is going to be uh, any sort of optimum here. And that, that in fact w with national treatment one of these countries may lose as a result of this depending on uh, the amount, for example, of, of innovation it does and, it, and, its, and its market size. Okay. Now, if, if I can just sort of, we can quantify this, uh, this spillover. And uh, I don't like to put up the formula, but I think, I think you could, it, it'll help to sort of see some intuition here. So what's the impact on the home country when the foreign country changes its uh, patent protection of home goods? Well, there's two components. The first pi star is just the profits that you gain. So when they extend patent protection uh, to, your, to your firms, you, they get more profits uh, from the foreign market, which is desirable. The second term is the induced innovations. Okay? And that's going to depend on, uh, the, the, the magnitude of that is going to depend on the size of the foreign market, pi star, relative to the total profits you're getting. Okay? Now, now, the reason I go through this is because uh, this is actually going to be useful if you start thinking about the design of equivalent concessions. So if you're thinking about how do we punish countries uh, if they deviate, okay, well, what you'd want to do is if, if the foreign country makes an obligation on mu star and then sets a lower level, uh, this would tell you how much compensation would be required in order to make the home country as well off as it would have been if the foreign country had kept its obligation. Okay? Now, 
if we have a very small, if we have a very small foreign country, so that that foreign country uh, has little impact on the world innovation rate when they deny access, then you can simply summarize the equivalent concession as the amount of profits you're losing in that market by losing the patent protection. Okay. In the case where the foreign market is big, then the equivalent concession is going to be bigger because not only do you lose the profits in that market, but those profits are significant enough that they change the overall level of innovation. Closed out of that market, your firms innovate less, and as a result, you get less uh, surplus uh, from this sort of public good uh, that's being produced by these, uh, uh, these firms. Okay? Now, let me very quickly talk about, um, so that was, that was the discriminatory component. Uh, let me now switch to the non-discriminatory component, the theta. So imagine now that you set the patent life on, on all products. So let's also add national treatment here. Uh, the picture is going to look essentially the same. Okay? And the, the reason it'll look the same is because now we still have the same sort of spillover that when I may lengthen my patent life, there's some uh, impact on profits of foreign firms to the extent that they're in this market. Okay? Now, the difference in this case, I think, comparing with uh, what, we, what we saw in the, uh, the previous case has to do with the, the way TRIP sets this rule. Okay? So the, this would say that the sort of mutually welfare improving uh, movements here would involve extending patent lives in, in both countries, uh, dealing with this sort of prisoner's dilemma. Uh, but, but I sort of interpret TRIPS here at least as saying that, that you're setting a minimum standard, or a good portion of it is setting a minimum standard. In the case of setting a minimum standard, if we take the, the minimum standard of the high property right country in this initial equilibrium, so that, that's the home country, uh, if, if you set an initial, if you force the foreign standard to the home standard, you actually lower the welfare of the foreign country. Okay? And so here is where I would make the argument of the importance of the bundling from the point of view of the TRIPS agreement, which is that the only way you're going to get the foreign country to comply with this agreement is if you bundle it with some sort of tariff concessions. So that, that the foreign country will only sign on if in return it gets some sort of tariff reduction, better access to the home, uh, home country. Uh, market. And in fact, if we look at the way TRIPS operates in the, in the dispute settlement process, it, it's, uh, it says you should, you should match uh, IPR uh, uh, punishments by imposing uh, retaliation in IPRs. But if that's not sufficient, then you cross over and move to other parts of the agreement, and eventually you get to goods. And so I would argue that, that you know, to make this thing self-enforcing, it's essential that you have that kind of spillover uh, so, that, so that the role here of supporting this type of agreement uh, is this spillover between uh, tariff uh, concessions and IPRs, uh, which are required to make uh, this enforceable. Okay? Uh, now, the one thing that this model, I think, does not explain, though, is the choice of the minimum standard. Because, in fact, this, this argument would... would uh, would argue for sort of uh, movements in this direction, uh, expansions in, in both countries. Uh, so I think uh, uh, you know, it would be interesting to s explore sort of alternative models of, uh, of innovation uh, for, uh, uh, for looking at this, this issue. Okay. Uh, let me let me be okay. One other issue I addressed here uh, in the paper: commitment issue. Uh, this might be a case where uh, uh, things look a bit different. I suppose the problem of one of the countries is that it it's unable to commit to its uh, promises on IPR. So suppose you can't commit to enforce. So uh, innovators do not believe commitments that you make about enforcement. Uh, it, in that situation, and you essentially can then change your policy after the innovators have made their decisions, the optimal IPR protection uh, from the point of view of the government is going to be zero. Okay? Because once the innovations are in place, uh, they have no incentive to create this, this IPR because uh, you simply generate deadweight loss. 
okay, and you're not going to induce any more inventions. Now, that's particularly strong in my very simple two-period model here, but it, it, it sort of illustrates the point. Now, of course, the zero IPR protection is potentially quite inefficient ex ante because of the fact that you will lose a lot of innovations. So another potential uh, role for dispute settlement uh, and, and a TRIPS agreement is as a commitment mechanism for governments that have difficulty committing uh, on IPR. So the idea here would be that because we've signed on to TRIPS and there's a dispute settlement mechanism which says that if you don't go along with this, you're going to get a trade sanction, uh, that, that makes a more direct cost to the government which might result in more uh, effective enforcement. Um, uh, so I just throw that out as another uh, uh, potential uh, impact here. Okay, so let, let me just uh, summarize here. Um, so, so what difference do IPRs make, okay, in terms of the agreement? Uh, three areas uh, I highlight in the paper. Um, one, I, one uh, the first one, they're more difficult to observe than uh, uh, trade deviations. So it may take longer to figure out that IPR protection is not, going, not being enforced. Courts may not be enforcing them in the way or, or laws may not be carried out. It's probably more costly to observe deviations. That's going to make it uh, more difficult to sustain uh, an agreement uh, because, because you, you weak, to the extent that you weaken the enforcement power, uh, you're going to make the agreement more difficult to sustain. That may make another reason why you'd want to tie it to a trade agreement. Um, the second point, uh, spillovers involving public goods. Uh, so we get this second uh, as well as the profit effect, uh, and, and which is going to mean that, that calculating the, uh, uh, the equivalent concessions are going to be uh, more difficult and more subtle than they would be in the pure trade case. And then finally, this idea of tying uh, the transfer of gains across agreements that are required and if, you, if you're going to make uh, uh, these minimum standard agreements uh, incentive compatible uh, and you know, sort of leaving aside the question of really if, if the minimum standard is the efficient type of agreement. Okay? Uh, let me just conclude by sort of arguing for, you know, I, th I think this is a useful approach to thinking about these sort of agreements and worrying about uh, in addition to the efficiency aspects but also the, uh, the incentives and the, the self-enforcing mechanisms that are required. Uh, to make these things uh, uh, agreements that will actually be uh, be carried out. So. Now he came in a, mo a minute under time. I get it. Particularly <laughs> impressive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now because it's getting late, we've decided to introduce a little bit of a variety show, and uh, uh, Rochelle and Graham are going to sort of switch places every couple of minutes to keep us all awake. No, we're not going to give. No, you won't. There you go. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Jerry and uh, Keith, for a great conference. And Eric, you are not the most technology challenged uh, of the people here. If you looked at our paper, you'll see that one sentence printed out on each page. Uh, if there are some of you who don't like that method of reading papers, we'd be happy to send you another copy. Just email us. Um, Graham and I were asked to accept uh, the Dick Nelson doctrine uh, that the public domain of science is necessary for progress and that it's increasingly being eroded by expanding intellectual property rights. We were asked to look at actions that governments might take to restore a scientific commons and to ask if these kinds of actions are consistent with the TRIPS agreement obligation. The TRIPS agreement is in many quarters, coming to be thought of, as Ruth said, entrenching a particular balance between producers and users of IP, or even worse, as a one-way ratchet, permitting protection levels to rise, but never to fall. Uh, and yet intellectual production is dynamic. As frontiers of knowledge shift, new opportunities and challenges arise. Uh, as several commentators have noted, there's actually a constellation of IP rules, rules on subject matter, requirements for protection, scope, exemptions, remedies, these are all tools that could be changed and realigned to accommodate these new challenges and also some of the other challenges that we've talked about in this conference. Well, is TRIPS supple enough to tolerate such realignments? We investigate that question by analyzing three test cases. 
three approaches to protecting the public domain of science. And our idea is first to see if they are TRIPS compliant, because we'd like to know that, and also to identify issues in TRIPS or in its current interpretation uh, that the panels, the appellate body, or the TRIPS council uh, might want to look at in greater depth. Uh, well, the three test cases are first, subject matter uh, carve-outs, second, fair use exemptions from liability, and third, limitations on remedies. Uh, and since you're all still awake, I'm going to anticipate our conclusions so that when you go to sleep, at least you'll have those. Um, and we're actually hopeful about all three of these approaches, uh, but we do see some difficulties. Some of the difficulties are substantive, uh, what the agreement says, uh, its formalism and its literalism, how it's interpreted, structural provisions uh, are seen as creating additive requirements for compliance, uh, and then finally what it omits. As both Carlos and Ruth noted, uh, there are no obligations to protect users. We also see some institutional design issues. Yesterday, several people said that the problem with TRIPS was that it was being administered by patent lawyers. But with all due respect, I have to say another problem with TRIPS is that it was negotiated by trade lawyers. Um, there's little evidence uh, that IP values were taken into account when that agreement was drafted. Uh, and perhaps it's the case that the public-private balance was to be left to member states. But unfortunately, there's also very little evidence that federalism values were much considered either. Now, I'm going to go through the first and the last of these approaches. Uh, and uh, as was said, uh, Graham's going to pop up in the middle and then come back at the end and talk about these conclusions in greater depth. So first, the subject matter approach. Uh, actually, there are two kinds of proposals uh, considered in, along these lines. One is to identify particular fields where patenting seems unnecessary or counterproductive and exclude those fields from the category of patentable subject matter. Uh, in another forum, John Barton suggested proteomics might be a candidate for that kind of a carve out. A second approach is to eliminate classes of inventive output, for example, upstream inventions, whose main significance is in innovation markets rather than in product markets. That's an approach that we ascribe to Richard Epstein, but who knows if he really remembers having said it. Um, the main problem with either of these approaches is arguably our Article 27 of TRIPS, which requires that patents be available in all fields of technology and that rights be enjoyable without discrimination as to the field of technology. We were especially eager to take on this particular problem because at least outside this room, it's rapidly becoming the conventional wisdom that Article 27 bars any form of tinkering that affects some one field more than it affects others. That's an impression that's certainly fostered by the Canada Pharmaceuticals case. That's the case uh, on Canada's stockpiling and regulatory review provisions, uh, which mainly did affect pharmaceuticals. And indeed, the panel in that case wrote a fairly strong decision, indicating that Article 27 is structural, which means that even government action that can be classified as an exception to rights, and therefore analyzed under Article 30, also has to be scrutinized for discrimination. That's the additive feature of the agreement. Moreover, the panel uh, said that prohibited discrimination could be de jure discrimination or de facto discrimination. Action targeted particular fields could violate Article 27, or simply action having a disparate impact on specific technologies. That could also be a violation. And that's why it's increasingly the case that Article 27 is being used, as Ruth said, as a shield. Uh, and any action that the legislature might take, rights holders say, can't do that. Article 27 presents it. Um, but like Jamie Love said yesterday, we too are very much not convinced that the panel decision should be read in this strict way. Certainly one goal of TRIPS was to require members that didn't offer protection to pharmaceuticals to do so. De jure discrimination of that sort was clearly a target. And what that might mean is that a bar on proteomics would in fact be problematic. But, does, <clears throat> excuse me, but does differentiation always amount to de jure discrimination? The fact is different fields have different needs. That's why there are so many different IP regimes, patent, copyright, uh, all the little regimes that Jerry talks about all the time. And even within patent law, there are marginal regimes. What do you call them, Jerry? Uh, and even within patent law, there are important differences. Uh, and that point was well illustrated by Tim Swanson's contrast between biotech and agricultural research. 
And indeed, the panel seems to have recognized that differentiation is not always bad, saying, quote, Article 27 does not prohibit bona fide exemptions to deal with problems that may exist only in certain product areas. And even if we're being overly optimistic about the meaning of that particular sentence, we're quite convinced that de facto discrimination couldn't possibly complete, be completely barred. De facto differences are inevitable. Consider the person with ordinary skill in the art. He'll know more in some fields than he'll know in others, and that inevitably leads to different outcomes on questions such as inventiveness, disclosure, and scope. We believe that at the very least, member states should be allowed to rebut a showing of disparate impact with a justification based on the legitimacy of purpose. Or actually, what's more correct is that the burden should be on the challenger to show why a particular practice is bad. And, the, and indeed, the panel had language to that effect, too. On the regulatory review provision, which it actually upheld, the panel said there was no evidence of, quote, a purpose to impose disadvantages as is often required to raise a claim of de facto discrimination. So we think the technology neutral approach suggested by Epstein, the bar on patenting all inventions with mainly upstream significance, that would be OK, even though it does have a disparate impact on science intensive fields, such as biotechnology, more than it has on other fields. But note, this is a really odd result. The state is on firmer ground when it paints with a broad brush, technology neutral bar, than when it touches up the real problem in a narrow and focused way with a narrow brush, the proteomics bar. So that's the formalistic feature uh, that we criticize uh, at the end. The second approach, Graham. Thanks, Rochelle. How much time are we at, Mike? Oh, let's see. We've used up seven minutes. All right. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll speak a little faster, but anyone who knows me knows I do that in a way. Mm -hmm. So this is actually not really Rochelle's fault that I'm speaking faster. A uh, second way uh, that we might go about ensuring the freedom to engage in a particular type of use of the patented invention is to create an exception uh, in the language of TRIPS or in the language of, uh, of our paper, exemptions. And the most likely candidate here is an exemption that uh, uh, has been already been referred to several times over the last two days, and that is a research exemption or experimental use exemption. Uh, John Barton, for example, included that as an essential element of his world patent system. Um, in the paper, we call that a targeted uh, exemption. But if you want to encourage what Wes Cohen uh, yesterday called the uh, felicitous ambiguity that might give rise to decentralized and informal uses, uh, you might prefer a more open-ended exemption. And indeed, there are scholars who have advocated such an approach in the domestic US context, most notably uh, Maureen O'Rourke, who suggested the, the adoption of a fair use doctrine in patent law, uh, somewhat like the fair use doctrine in, in copyright law. Uh, we're particularly confident that a targeted exemption like a research exemption or experimental use uh, would, in fact, be TRIPS compliant. But in the paper, we explore whether the open-ended approach might also be uh, trip, TRIPS compliant, because we think that might allow us to test the TRIPS agreement at its edges and maybe tackle some harder interpretive questions. Well, the starting point for any analysis of exceptions is Article 30, which uh, you probably know, but I'll just state so everyone's on the same page which requires that any exception, first of all, be limited. Secondly, that it doesn't unreasonably conflict with the normal exploitation of the patent. And third, it doesn't unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the patentee, taking into account the legitimate interests of third parties, the so-called three-step test. Um, I don't have time to rehearse uh, all our arguments with respect to each of those steps. What I'm instead going to do is focus on what we thought was the most challenging, and that is the second step, the conflict uh, with normal exploitation of the patent. Um, the, if you look at the, the Canada Pharmaceutical Patents uh, panel report, uh, the term normal, which is the norm from which any deviation is then measured, uh, was defined by the panel as uh, exploitation uh, that includes the right to exclude all forms of competition that could detract significantly from the economic returns anticipated from a patentee's grant of mar patent grant of market exclusivity. Similarly, the panel suggested that the notion of normal might be heavily influenced by uh, what was a typical byproduct of uh, the patents market e exclusivity. Um, and it's unclear whether that typicality uh, reference was a reference to typical across a variety of nations or typical within the subject market of the national law that was being challenged. Uh, the second one's a little harder, so we sort of take that on. Uh, because obviously, the introduction of a fair use or any other type of defense or exemption would surely render non-infringing certain acts that are presently uh, would be infringing and for which the patent owners might therefore be able to extract payment. Does that mean that any such defense would conflict with the normal exploitation? 
We think not. Uh, uh, existing national laws that accord patentees the ability to exploit should not be permitted to entrench an international norm, and we think we can find some support uh, for that both in, in the Canada uh, patent case and also in the United States Section 1105 case, which we mentioned in the, in the paper, uh, because such an approach exalts prior laws, even, those, even though those laws may not actually reflect international prescribed minimum standard. States are generally free to maintain protection, maintain protection in excess of those floors, and no rule of international intellectual property law, either before TRIPS or we suggest in TRIPS, suggests that when states do enact higher than required levels of protection, they are prohibited from reassessing the appropriate balance and offering protection that more closely hews to the minimum level. Indeed, to suggest otherwise, we create a rather perverse result where states might be reluctant to make expansions of intellectual property rights, lest they're thereby precluded from readjusting levels of protection later uh, through grants of an exemption. It would, also led, it would also elevate single national legislative determinations to the status of international law, and seems inconsistent with the notion that member states' economic and social circumstances will change over time, and the state should be free to adjust national laws to accommodate that. Finally, from an institutional and political perspective, it would validate the refrain of many critics of recent international intellectual property developments that the system operates as a one-way ratchet. So we conclude that Article 30's concept of normal exploitation should not be assessed simply uh, by reference to prior levels of exploitation without considering uh, the normative dimension uh, to the question. Before turning things back to Rochelle, let me address the fourth step in the three-step test, which may sound like I'm an economist all of a sudden. Uh, but in fact, if you, uh, if you look at the Canada uh, opinion, uh, you find that they applied 27.1 to the 30 rule. Um, and we think this is wrong. Um, as Rochelle explained, there are good reasons why different technologies uh, or different users might require different exemptions. If technology-specific imbalances require technology-specific redress, it seems counterproductive that such exemptive redress uh, should extend to all technologies regardless of need. Indeed, such an approach uh, appears particularly anomalous, as Roussel said, and it makes a broader than necessary exemption sustainable and almost necessary under international law, which seems inconsistent with the basic norm uh, uh, that in the Article uh, 30 that any exceptions be limited, which is the first step of that test that I didn't talk about. So we believe TRIPS should actually be more favorably disposed to exemptions that are cast in specific or targeted terms. Um, and a formalist commitment to technological neutrality by virtue of the uh, uh, super, super imposition of Article 27 is not demanded, we suggest, by the kind of purpose of reading of the TRIPS agreement that Yus was averting to a little bit earlier. So with that, I'll turn it back to Rochelle. Okay, our third approach uh, is the one that Dick Nelson alluded to uh, during his talk. Um, it's, a, uh, it's one that would make non-commercial research organizations, universities, and their employees immune from liability if, first, the, patent materials, the patented materials that they needed were not available on reasonable terms. Second, the researcher agreed to publish the results of the work. And third, the researcher waived the right to patent the results, or at least waived the right to license out on an exclusive basis. Now, is this approach compatible with TRIPS? Uh, there are no close decisions here, so we're now engaging in pure speculation. Uh, and the first issue is which provisions of the TRIPS agreement would provide the relevant analysis. It could be Article 30, which was actually cited in the legislative run-up to Section 287, which is the surgical procedure exemption in U.S. patent law on which this idea is based. Uh, if so, then what Graham uh, just said would hold true here, too, and even more so, because there's less intrusion into rights holders' interest in that the waivers would only attract those whose work is very upstream and all other uses of the patent would be protected. But we're not sure that Article 30 is actually the right approach. The remedial provisions of the TRIPS agreement are in many ways starkly different from the other provisions. There much more deference is given in those provisions to domestic choices. That's most obvious in Section 41.5, which says that members do not have an obligation to, place, to put into place an enforcement apparatus for IPRs that's distinct from the enforcement of laws in general. There's also Article 6 on exhaustion, uh, which allows states to decide how many times a patentee can assert her rights. This autonomy should at the least be made an explicit part of a Rule 30 analysis reflecting on several of the issues in the three-step test, but bet or four-step test. But we believe 
that a better uh, measure of a member's remedies would be only against the standards that the agreement specific remedial provisions provide. That is not to add 30 to 44, 45, and 41. Now, as to substance, we think that an immunity provision would be TRIPS compatible. Consider the provisions for monetary rewards under Article 45. It's clearly meant to reflect local conditions. Monetary damages are measured by the patentee's loss, which depends on what the locals like the product and can afford to pay for it, the availability of parallel imports and price controls, and our proposal similarly limits recovery by local ability to pay. Furthermore, as I said, the TRIPS agreement doesn't require any more enforcement of IP law than law in general, and courts do not generally award speculative damages. Remedies for using upstream inventions are, in fact, rather speculative. Artie didn't call them low-value and uncertain-value research for nothing. Of course, this approach also entails a denial of injunctive relief. TRIPS compatibility of that aspect is a bit harder to reckon because the agreement is, again, somewhat ambiguous on the relationships between its provisions. Here, the relationship between Article 44 and the obligations attendant compulsory licenses under Article 31. But ignoring that complication, we think that the decision to deny relief against users who waive their rights would pass muster. Article 44 requires the courts be authorized to grant injunction. It doesn't require them to award injunctive relief. Injunctions are equitable remedies, and judges routinely exercise their discretion in equity to protect important social purposes, such as protecting the public domain uh, of knowledge. It's also worth stepping back and looking at these remedial provisions as a whole. The lack of protection for parallel imports and price controls, other interventions that could deal with social purposes, mean that the rewards that innovators can extract from world markets will be affected by domestic decisions. It's hard to believe that members are not equally entitled to influence the costs that innovators face. In the final analysis, it's important to remember that TRIPS isn't just a trade agreement, it's also an IP agreement, and you have to take IP values into account. And on that, Graham will now pop up. <laughs> oh, three. All right. Well, uh, uh, I was actually uh, uh, going to conclude with a couple of uh, 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 sort of systemic observations, but I'm going to try and focus on one. Uh, what we end up concluding, as Russell mentioned, is that all three approaches potentially uh, could pass muster. Um, and the paper provides, I hope, the arguments for why that might be the case. But more important, what we want to do, uh, not only with this paper, with future iterations, is to try and develop sort of broader themes that we see uh, that were uh, actually uh, raised uh, and revealed by our, our own analysis. Uh, the, the level of formalism in this analysis of going through each different provision aimed at the same purpose according to a different set of rules is something that uh, uh, raised substantial concerns with us. But uh, given the constraints of time, I'll, I'll skip to the second systemic concern that we wanted to raise. And that is what we were calling the neo-federalism of TRIPS. Um, because some of the policy objectives that we seek to uh, allow could be achieved either by particular readings of the substantive provisions, uh, but they could also be achieved by the implicit and sometimes explicit of allocation of authority between national and international law. And in developing the content of that allocation of authority, uh, we believe that some regard must be had to the system of international IP as a whole and not, not just the specific language of TRIPS. And we find some support for that, in particular in the U.S. 110.5 opinion. And to the extent it's not there, we'd like to develop it. Um, some of the variables that we suggest would contribute to the, uh, these neo-federalist principles are, first of all, an understanding of which principles in TRIPS are what we call structural, in the sense that they pre-populate other provisions. Uh, we were skeptical about the reach of Article 27, or at least skeptical of the reach that the Canada Pharmaceutical Patents uh, uh, Panel put on it. We're more attracted to the notion that the remedies provision in Article 41.5 uh, might be treated like that. Uh, we also recognize uh, that it's an inherent part of the broader international IP system and always has been that hard laws such as TRIPS are essentially backwards looking uh, and should not easily intrude into contested uh, national political waters. This enhances the consent-based legitimacy of the international system. Yet this doesn't prevent uh, it being dynamically interpreted to permit states to revise their national laws to, in, to reflect uh, different priorities as times change. But the default rule is still that states have autonomy and flexibility to work within these very general parameters established by TRIPS. And we heard concern yesterday expressed by, by Heinz Kluck that flexibility might be something that simply inures to the benefit of the powerful. And what I understood to be his concern was not actually the positive value of flexibility uh, that we endorse. Rather, I think what he was complaining about was the imbalance 
of mandatory patent rights, but only permissible exceptions uh, on, on limits. That's a product of historical development, which in a new era where most countries will offer the basic rights will probably require revision to include what, at least in the EU context a few years ago, I called substantive maxima to balance substantive minima. And I think this also picks on some of the stuff that Ruth was discussing. But that, I think, is a new instrument. Uh, in the meantime, we believe flexibility, and perhaps even more importantly, the political will to exploit that flexibility uh, is a positive value that we need to endorse and further. So in the paper, we started to sketch uh, these types of systemic values uh, as they were revealed to us by our analysis of the three test cases. We hope to have at least developed the arguments for why certain national legislative approaches are indeed potentially compliant with TRIPS. But more importantly, we hope that this paper and the future uh, evolutions in it begin to articulate the systemic principles uh, that can be used to read TRIPS in a way that enables international norms to be developed uh, consistent with the le legitimate demands of national patent policy. Thanks. OK, it's now time for what Jamie Boyle referred to as the crypto papers. Um, we have two crypto speakers. I know it's the end of the day. Crypto um, papers, and that not they only crypto have seven speakers. Minutes. But because it's the end of the day, and because they only have seven minutes, they deserve our utmost attention. Uh, Wilfred, the floor is yours. OK. Um, to save a few seconds, I'll use, speak to this, this microphone here. These are three very different papers, so I'm sure you'll all be immensely relieved to hear that uh, I intend to uh, ignore the ground rules and speak for 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, this will also illustrate difficulties inherent in any WTO dispute settlement, uh, dispute settlement mechanism. I have uh, three basic points I want to make. That works out to 15 minutes per point for the benefit of the lawyers that are here. Uh, I'll make a token attempt to relate each of these to, uh, to a, uh, uh, one of the papers, uh, but you're right, this is a crypto paper. Okay. Uh, first point concerns the nature of uh, trade agreements, what, the, what their basic function is. Uh, this is important because it determines what any dispute settlement mechanism ought to try to be preserving. Uh, among trade economists, the prevalent view is that trade agreements exist to deal with uh, uh, terms of trade ex externalities uh, resulting from unilateral determination of trade policy. And it, uh, also uh, 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 an attitude that prominent among uh, trade, prevalent among trade theorists, but held by almost no one else, that the basic features of the GATT and WTO can be explained, ex explained by this. Uh, this viewpoint, though, is, is basically a fantasy because existing trade agreements, uh, in, in fact, uh, don't limit the ability of, of signatories in almost all cases, to manipulate uh, or, or to, to manipulate uh, market power in world markets by taxing, taxing exports. Uh, the, what I think is valuable in, in uh, the, the Bagwell-Steger approach that Rick uh, relied on is the insistence that trade agreements uh, are intended to deal with uh, externalities. Uh, international e e externalities. Uh, th the approach, unfortunately, focused on an externality of no practical relevance, which uh, potentially makes makes the approach irrelevant. But, but, but the fact that it does focus on international externalities, I think, gives gives a lot of a, a reason for confidence that certain basic ideas, such as the role of reciprocity, would would, would uh, survive even in w when addressing more relevant uh, externalities. So, so this isn't the devastating on comment on, on Rick's, uh, Rick, Rick's starting point. Uh, uh, secondly, the nature of dispute settlement uh, process. Uh, again, there's a prevalent idea uh, that uh, among uh, trade theorists uh, that, that uh, one of the purposes, at least, of a dispute settlement process is, is to provide punishment to deter, deter violations. Uh, in, in bashing a trade theorist, I'm playing a Benedict Arnold role here, but this, but this is the end of the day. It's two, two days and very punishing schedule, so I you know, forgiven for this, I hope. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I think this is, the, uh, if, if you take this approach, a question that comes up, as, as Rick re alluded to in his, his, his paper, is why are the punishments so weak? They're basically a, a tit, tit for tat. Well, well I, I think this, this prevalent view basically is a, is a basic misconception, and, and that the, the uh, a fundamental role of a dispute settlement process is not to facilitate punishment, but actually to constrain it. 
the, the potential for actual punishment is there because of the bilateral nature of the agreements. If I don't get from this trade agreement what I've bargained for, then I'm going to retaliate. So th this is obviously related to, to, uh, to Joost uh, Paulin's uh, uh, point from a legal point of view, uh, his, his argument, which I found persuasive. Uh, but don't be flattered by that. My legal knowledge is such that uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd probably be persuaded by a third-rate ambulance chaser, actually. <laughs> You're right. But, 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 but uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the purpose is, is, is I th of, of these agreements, I think, is, is uh, to prevent uh, the punishment that takes place from doing violence to the basic reciprocity, which is the heart of, of these international agreements. And by, by, uh, by making that uh, the equivalent withdrawal of concession does exactly that. It, it preserves reciprocity on a, on, on a bilateral lateral basis. So the purpose isn't to punish, it's to it's to preserve the essence, essence of the agreement. Uh, OK. Um, uh, with respect to TRIPS and, and the relationship of, of, of that, uh, the, the significance of TRIPS obviously isn't that it addresses international property rights in an international setting. That's been done by conventions and agreements for over, over 100 years. But what's new about TRIPS is that it, performs, uh, it, it provides a, a comprehensive framework, comprehensive both in the issues involved and in the nations uh, th that are involved, and, and also incorporates our, our has a dispute settlement mechanism, and that's a dispute settlement mechanism. It's not a, a deterrent mechanism, and it's certainly not an a, 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 a enforcement mechanism. Uh, this, this implies, or presumably will imply, uh, have effects on the legal ev evolution of international property law, as, as uh, Dreyfus and Dinwiddie pointed out, and there'll be economic uh, consequences to that. Uh, but I'm more interested in another economic aspect of it, and, and th that's the following. Uh, the, the earlier pre-TRIPS uh, agreements on intellectual property were by and large agreements between states which, which perceived a mutual self-interest in so such agreeing. Uh, those states that didn't perceive such an interest simply didn't participate. For example, in the 19th century, the U.S. wouldn't conclude a copyright law with Britain because the U.S. was a heavy importer of British literature. And when the balance of literary trade began to change, so did U.S. moral attitudes towards, towards, uh, towards copyright protection. Uh, what's different about TRIPS is be because of its comprehensive nature, it involves uh, both countries, uh, countries that, in fact, do not perceive intellectual property protection to be in their overall interest by itself, mainly, uh, m mostly, mostly develop, uh, uh, developing uh, uh, developing uh, uh, countries. Uh, so, so what I, I think it should be looked at is in the context of a more comprehensive bargain, such as took place in the, uh, in the early Uruguay round, where countries uh, developing countries primarily, are accepting uh, 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 intellectual property uh, uh, responsibilities, at least nominally, that they perceive not to be in their interest in exchange for other concessions, notably trade concessions that they perceive are in their interest. One, one, one can question uh, the, the, the fairness or, or, or the terms of this bargain, and, and also to some degree the bargain is a forward contract, and you can question what will actually come at the end, end of the period. But nevertheless, that's the nature of, 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 the, of the bargain. And I think the implication of this is to strongly endorse uh, Rick's, Rick's point about about bundling these these two types and dream on about tri uh, bundling these 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 two types type types of uh, types of agreements not just because there may not be punishments available unless you incorporate trade concessions but uh, balancing the two against the other is really what the very essence of the bargain is and that's what a dispute settlement mechanism if that's what's going to be used ought to be ought, ought to be addressing okay. thank you You'll, you'll observe that I, I didn't uh, fulfill my threat of 45 minutes. That's because it was just an economist estimate. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you were not in any way obeying instructions from a lawyer. No. <laughs> Greg, um, you're the last speaker, and we will quite literally be hanging on every word. <laughs> I, w I had to be someplace else, so I just got here today, and I actually didn't see all the papers, so I'll do my best to comment. But when I was asked to comment, I was told that I could, I was, is a fairly liberal definition of what commenting would be. Um, in terms of recognition of, w, of public goods and WTO dispute settlement, I'm going to take a more socio-legal approach. And I think what came out of many of these presentations, especially the legal ones, is just how knowledge-intensive, how 
to understand sort of the, the, the rules and try to apply them, um, how, legal, how legally astute one needs to be. Um, and so I'm going to talk about when. So first, a bit about public goods, private rights. I mean, for me, um, you know, private rights are tools in order to try to achieve public goods. And the key issue is how does one define those rights and who defines those rights? Um, and but it's also even more complicated in this particular scenario because there are multiple public goods at stake. I mean, there's one. There's the generation of science, the technology. Um, there's the issue of of free trade as a, as a public good in its ideal sense of being able to benefit from a variety of uh, products um, at lower prices. These two can be in conflict. And when you go to the uh, realm of pharmaceutical patents, you have the public good of public health. Um, to the extent that there is public health, we're all better off. Um, and so the question is, how does one generate these different public goods? And then how does one balance them um, uh, when they're in conflict? Who decides who decides is ultimately the question. And I think the Canada patent case is a wonderful example because not only are trade lawyers, and two, with respect to both Jusa, uh, Jusa paper and Rochelle's and, um, and Graham's, and that is, first of all, it's Juice. Clearly, who's participating? This is a dispute by the EC against Canada. The United States is acting as a third party in this dispute, but it has systemic effects on the definition of key articles of TRIPS, which can affect then how, what, how it's going to play down the road with respect to developing countries, and how it also plays not just in disputes, but in the shadow of the law, in terms of if you're going to have generic uh, drug producers trying to export products into developing countries, this particular dispute is going to affect their decision-making process. Um, and then in terms of who decides, who decides these were, you know, this is a trade body, it's trade diplomats, trade lawyers. I spoke to one of the people on this panel. They surely, they certainly, I mean, they're clearly admitted that they had no background in intellectual property rights. So all of the sort of the, the wonderful um, nuances addressed in Graham's paper and Rochelle's, um, they're not within the sort of the immediate consciousness of the people who are trying to interpret these particular agreements, which clearly have the possibility for multiple readings. So how these agreements are going to be read, how they're going to be interpreted, rather through, whether through a political process, through negotiations in the TRIPS Council, or whether before a judicial body, who participates matters. And as you have political blockages within the WTO, you have de facto delegation of decision-making authority to judicial panels. And so who participates before those judicial panels matters. And I think the reason why Jerry asked me to come here is because I've done a major project in terms of participation before dispute settlement panels and developing countries. And the figures, I'll just give you a few of the figures. First of all, the United States has participated as a party or third party in 95% of decisions adopted by panels or by the appellate body. The EC in 80% of cases. No developing country comes close to those sorts of figures. Okay. So who systemically is able to affect the, 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 the interpretation of WTO law over time is being shaped by US interests and by EC interests and developing countries have not been able to participate. If you look at developing countries are five times more likely since the creation of the WTO to be a defendant in a case than they were under the GATT regime. Developing countries are one third less likely um, taking, uh, bringing cases against developed countries than they were in the former GATT regime. Um, if you look in terms of the amount of the percentage of the trading profiles of developing countries, they're two, in terms of their trade with developed, developed countries, developed countries are bring twice as many cases against developing countries compared to the amount that developed countries trade with developing countries. And developing countries are much more likely to bring cases against other developing countries than they are against developed countries in terms of their trade. Why? This is a very expensive process. In the Indonesia Autos case, it cost Indonesia one, over $1 million just through the panel stage. We're not even talking about going to appellate body stage, arbitration <laughs> compliance panels, interpretation arbitration panels, et cetera. A very expensive process. Developing countries are not repeat players in this process, so they have much higher, they don't benefit from economies of scale of developing local expertise, lo bureaucratic expertise as the United States and Europe who are participating as repeat players. Um, they have small economies, so even though they may have very 
a case may be of great importance to them in terms of the relative value. It may be worth 10% of their economy, but the threshold of litigation costs compared to the importance of this high value case, they don't, they're not going to meet it as easily, certainly as the US and the European community. So they, they will not take high stakes case. And get, in light of WTO remedies, how there's a great uncertainty in terms of, first of all, the outcome, and then even if they were to win a case, right, the w remedies are very weak. That they're going to devalue when they make the if they're making even a rational decision whether or not to bring the case. This is assuming if they have the legal knowledge to actually defend themselves, um, they rationally will decide not to bring it or to settle it. And the bargaining in the shadow of the law is really is clear here. Bargaining in two senses: one, what does the law actually what sort of bargaining chips does it provide you? But also the law permits you to impose litigation costs. If you can absorb those litigation costs, and the other party, a weaker party, can't absorb those litigation costs, in that bargaining situation, they're in a much weaker position. So I think we need to take this account in terms of uh, what's going to take what's taking place in the trips uh, situation. Um, we generate we have I, I calculate calculated about 100 lawyers teaching WTO law in the United States to about 2,000 students. That's not even counting intellectual property rights. There's a lot of local knowledge here available. That's not available in most developing countries. Um, in terms of, so then the question is what to do. And then since I only got a minute, I'll tell you. Um, this is, <laughs> we're trying to create a, a project where we're going to have seven different regional meetings to bring together the private sector, regulatory authorities, trade officials, uh, civil society in each region in the world um, to try to share best practices, how are countries trying to adapt to this system, et cetera. One clearly is to pool resources. Um, if you pool resources, you're more likely to be a repeat player. It'll be more cost effective to participate. Um, Clearly, Greece is better off with the legal service um, in, at the, in Brussels, the European community. How to try to pool le uh, resources for developing countries with expertise and TRIPS IP issues. It's the only way that they're going to be able to participate much more effectively. Secondly, you're going to need the United States and Europe. I have a book coming out on the suit of these public private linkages in WTO litigation in the US and Europe. Clearly, you're going to have to do that with developing countries too, with the generic sector. Activists and academics and government officials, they're going to have to know what the generic sector needs, right, if they're going to be able to export uh, products. You create a, an agreement with too much uncertainty, you might have a great agreement on paper, but the, the generics will not invest in manufacturing. Um, third, you're going to have to affect domestic politics in the United States and Europe. So there has to be north-south linkages. If you cannot um, affect the political process in the United States, it's much more likely that U.S. positions are going to reflect discrete interests. Um, and finally, you're going to have to coordinate at multiple levels. It's a multi-level game. You've got to play in domestic politics in the United States and Europe. You have to play at the international level, and you have to play in multiple levels before judicial processes as well. Thanks. Uh, be before I take any questions, I want to remind you that it's a very nice day outside. The Washington Duke Inn and Golf Club is a five-minute walk in that direction. They have a very nice bar, and the bar has a terrace. The trees are all in flower. In light of that information, there will be a reception officially starting there at 7.30, but you can go earlier. In light of this information, is there anyone who has a burning question of such critical importance that it cannot wait a few minutes? Yes, please. One very quick question. In the context of public goods, and, and this applies to the whole panel because no one talked about it, uh, I think it's in, in the context of public goods with the trip agreement, I think it's critical to look at what non violation and situation of blame would mean in the context of public goods as opposed to violation. The fifth ministerial conference in Cancun is going to make a decision on, on, on how that applies to the fifth agreement. But clearly, I think that there's a question of how non violation expression complaints in the context of bilateral and all that is going on, how the applicability of non violation expression complaints will affect uh, how you deal with that in the future. Okay, let's pull a couple more questions right at the back, please. Uh, about uh, Professor Bond's presentation, the economic model about, uh, it, uh, it sort of seemed to me almost sort of a Pollyanni sort of model about how 
everybody gets together with WTO and comes up with some welfare maximizing strategy to expand uh, intellectual property protection in the area that, in the patent area that sort of consistently sort of raises overall welfare. I mean, that's the way it was presented. But, uh, two issues with the model. One, I mean, that you could perhaps incorporate. One is uh, the way we fund, for example, medicine is a combination of public and private expenditures. With the SARS out right now, it's a pretty good illustration. There's a ton of public sector work going on all over the world to try and deal with this uh, exploding public health crisis. And it's not all coming out of Kaiser and Merck, I can tell you. A lot of it's coming out of uh, public sector institutions. There's nothing in the WTO that deals with how you share the burdens of public sector to serve. Now, why is that important? Well, if your only tool is the patent system, if your only tool is the private right, you have a tendency to kind of continue to pound and pound and pound on that, just sort of load up on that, even though it may not be the best instrument for everything you can imagine. So by excluding one of the two instruments, which is, you know, to sort of have a fair burden of the public sector, public domain, public good type, so you can only rely on the privatized thing, it's an imbalance in terms of what your instincts are, and probably too much of an emphasis on that. That's one problem. And the other thing is that there's a change in the political economy, and that is to say, in the old days, Big Pharma would lobby the U.S. Congress to screw U.S. consumers, and that was a particular battle that would go, go on. Now they lobby USTR to extend the sort of uh, uh, policy beyond the U.S. borders, so then it basically, if we, if we adopt a very tough IPR regime, it isn't American consumers that are bearing the, the burden of it, it's world consumers, and so pharma has big time incentives to invest in the political economy because they can not only extend it to the U.S. economy, they can extend it to the world, and then that carries over into the WTO contract. Okay, third question right here. Yeah, um, it, it's the question on enforcement of trips. Um, China is a uh, WTO member, um, therefore it's bound by trips in principle, and even prior to the session of WTO, uh, it signed the wide-ranging bilateral IPR agreement with the United States, go to China today, you will see piracy of software, media products, pharmaceuticals, uh, motor scooters, and even late model, model cars are effectively counterfeited by Chinese manufacturers. You know, and this seems to happen to a considerable extent. Now, if you fear that TRIPS has placed us in a kind of apocalypse of, uh, you know, overstrong patent rights, uh, then maybe this is a reason for hope, right? Because the uh, uh, gap between what the law seems to imply and the reality on the ground, at least in one report, emerging markets are the war. Um, if you think trips is a good thing, it's very bad. And, you know, I, I'm wondering if about the realistic ability of the dispute settlement mechanism to uh, force compliance. Um, does this mean that, uh, you know, whatever the law states, um, we're not going to be in that world for some time to come, given the reality? Yes. Last question. Um, this is a, just a comment on Bramsworth's sales paper, which I think is great. It reminds me of another <coughs> part of the sales paper um, on putting the Uruguay round and dispute settlement together, which is one of those papers that got so underlined and highlighted that it fell apart and I had to order another copy. Um, but my, my comment goes to sort of the, the underlying theme of dynamic interpretation, which is the, in order to sort of take into account the IT system as a whole and its change in finance and priorities. And I think that's something upon which you're putting some weight on two panel decisions. And I think one other source to look at with one caveat note is obviously you mentioned shrimp, you also mentioned shrimp turtle and the, the, there are references and discussions to evolutionary norms there. But as he noted, they are based on sort of the common intentions of the parties <coughs> with respect to other particular areas like in that case environmental law. But the, the issue being um, with respect to intellectual property is I'm not sure we have the common intentions that support that kind of in evolutionary interpretation. You're actually looking at disparate approaches in national laws. And so there's some support for what you're doing in Trim Turtle, but there's also maybe a cautionary note as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to give each of the panelists the opportunity to respond, starting with Just and also reminding them that we're now operating on borrowed time. Just. Yeah. Well, <laughs> The, the, the non-violation question is very, it's a very difficult legal yes. issue, I think. And as you know, for the, for the moment in GATT, for normal trade disputes, you can bring both a violation complaint. The rules are violated, so you bring a case. But you can also bring a, a complaint even if the rules have not been violated, if you somehow, uh, if your benefits have been impaired. You've 
given a, a tariff concession, but uh, in the, on, on, on the other side, in, in the back door, you've, you've uh, um, circumvented that concession by giving a, a subsidy to your domestic producers. So one thing offsets the other. In the TRIPS context, it's imaginable that you could have a similar situation. So you don't, you're not really breaking the rules, but you do something else. Say you in, introduce a competition code or so that may upset your, the, the standard IP protection. So you could imagine that you can challenge the competition code, not because it violates the rules, but because it upsets uh, the, the balance of concessions. I, I, I think it's a bad idea, personally, because at least the TRIPS agreement looks much more like rules rather than uh, tariff concessions. So I, I think it would be quite dangerous, especially for developing countries, we can, because then the US could bring in all kinds of complaints that are not really foreseeable. Um, on the question, the, the China issue, I, I think it, it, com it comes back to my point that I was trying to make in that the system is run by government interests. If you would open it up to private parties, I'm sure lots of companies would sue China. But for the moment, it's a question of politics, I guess. Eric? Okay. Uh, two quick comments. One, the, the Pollyanna comment. Uh, what these, this approach says is that w what is going to come out of it is an agreement that makes the governments involved better off depending on what they maximize. So it's, it's easy enough to put greater weight on the profits of the firms involved, which I think is an essential part of, uh, uh, of these agreements and essentially a terms of trade effect. And it's not really going to change the basic message of what I say. Okay? It's, going to, it's going to change the composition, but the direction is, is going to be exactly the same. And the second one involving China, I think the point is, uh, uh, well, I mean, my comment about the difficulty of enforcement, the, the uh, observability of these deviations, or of these violations is just going to be you know, a magnitude uh, more difficult than the, the TRIPS cases, because you've got, to, you've got to pursue the enforcement in courts. And that's, that's going to take much more longer to work out and going to make it much more difficult to enforce them. Uh, Rochelle? Uh, yeah, on the non-violation complaints, uh, there's a moratorium on non-violation complaints, and it was extended. And I think that's in part because it's really difficult to figure out what a non-violation complaint would be in this context. Uh, in the article that fell apart of Larry's, uh, Andy Lowenfeld and I actually do talk about what that might look like. And it really was hard, hard to figure that out. Uh, that article, by the way, also anticipated that the developing countries would have all of the problems that you've now so very nicely uh, documented. Uh, on enforcement and compliance in uh, China, uh, you know, here's my Pollyanna view. I like to think that this bargain that these countries entered into wasn't quite so bad as what we thought because they knew they didn't have courts and they knew they wouldn't have to uh, comply until uh, they actually had an infrastructure that would a, enable compliance, but at the same time be the kind of infrastructure that might also mean that they were developed enough to be getting some benefits out of the TRIPS agreement. That's Grant. very Pollyanna. Uh, I'll be very quick. Larry, I sort of agree with, uh, I think, almost everything you said, so not that much in response, other than to say uh, that, that, in fact, yeah, we're relying largely, uh, at least in the TRIPS context, on the, the, the two panel reports, and there's not much more there, obviously, at, at the moment. What's interesting about the extent to which in, in the 1105 case that they relied on the WIPO Copyright Treaty is they expressly disavow any reliance on the Vienna Convention, different heads of uh, sources of international law, but still say we kind of like it and like to take it into account because it helps create the overall sort of uh, framework uh, for international corporate law taken together, which was, even, I think, quite creative, uh, if I can be polite, uh, creative way of, of bringing it in, given the lack of any sources, which may get you going along the lines that Ruth was suggesting in terms of the necessary relation between the copyright treaties and the, and the others. In terms of the, the dynamism, um, we, 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 dynamism really at two levels. There's a dynamism in the way we want to see the treaty provisions interpreted, but perhaps even more importantly, a dynamism in, at the national level. That is to say, there has to be enough flexibility in the international standards to allow the national laws to have a dynamic component so they can react and change to whatever changing circumstances. So you're right, there's, it's, we're, we're basing it on not an awful lot at the moment, but probably not an awful lot more there that we can really take. Wilford? In terms of non-violation complaints, my, my impression is that in, in terms of economic outcome, uh, economic effects, that they've been virtually zero in the past, and I, I don't see any reason to, to expect them to change. And, and uh, with respect to the China situation, my, my impression is, is that thus far, at least, this bargain of exchanging trade concessions for intellectual property right protection has uh, yielded uh, 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 very little delivery on both sides. Great. It's been a long day.
<laughs> and it has uh, Jerry, Jennifer, any announcements? Yes, right, email. One time change tonight, possible forward. Please remember that, or you'll be here an hour late tomorrow. Um, two, a lot of people have asked about getting to the airport tomorrow. The easiest thing is probably just to leave your bags at your hotel, take the transportation back there if you're staying the whole day, and get a cab from your hotel. However, if you're leaving during the day and want to leave from here, um, we do have students that can watch your bags for you, and we have a taxi service that's very reliable. You just need to tell a student what time you want to leave, and they'll call a the taxi, and so that's your other option, your choice. Um, three, many people have asked about giving out a list of addresses, or at least emails, not only for the participants, but for all the attendees here. Um, we are happy to do that. I just want to give anyone the option to opt out of that in case you know you value your privacy and don't want to be spammed by emails. And so if you do not want to be on this list that will be emailed to all the participants and attendees of this conference, please email me. I'll give you my email, jenkins at law.duke.edu. If you don't want your email distributed, please email me so we can, we can you know, maintain your privacy. That's it. Dinner's at 8, like Michael said. Uh, reception is at 7.30 and the bar is open. Uh, thank you speakers. Thank you audience. Uh, I'll see you at 7.30.